I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Let's stand. We are studying the word abiding from John chapter 15 and verse 4. And we would like to get your attention to that passage, John chapter 15 and the first five verses. And they read as follows, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already are you clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Moreover, uh, uh, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, he says, you can do nothing. We're going to continue where we left off earlier today, and we invite your attention as we study from John chapter 15, looking at that word abiding. As we were closing out this morning, we said that the classical writers used the word meno, meaning to stay, to stand fast, to remain or abide. And it has the idea to remain at home or to stay where you are and not wander off. The word translated abide is one of the Apostle John's favorite words, we said. He uses it 34 times in his gospel and 19 times in his letters. The word uh, meno means to dwell at one's house, at his own house, to stay as a guest in someone's home, or to abide or to sustain unbroken fellowship with someone. It means to have a friend who abides, to always be present to help you in times of need. Now, the Apostle John uses it to say that God abides in Christ. We know that as a fact because of what Christ himself said. He said, I am in the Father and the Father in me. The Father who remains in me does his own work. And in John 10, 38, Jesus said, The Father is in me and I in the Father. And so the question was asked, How does Jesus accomplish what he does? The answer is simple. The Father abides in me and does his work. Now just think, how does the Father abide in him and does his work except through him? Because Christ, of course, was on earth and what he was doing on earth was not his will but his Father's will. Now, we are saying this to say that indeed Jesus is the one person who was completely at the disposal of his father. Keep that word in mind, at the disposal of the father. Whatever the father want done, 
He did it through Jesus Christ. And Jesus didn't have, let's say, he didn't choose to give himself or put himself in a position to say, I have a choice. The only choice he had was to do his father's will. That's why he came down to earth. That being the case, and we are his disciples, what choices do we have? Except to do what Christ wants us to do if we abide in him. It's like Paul says in Galatians 2 and verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. So Paul is in essence saying, listen, it's not me, it's Christ. Remember Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. That's the idea. He is abiding in Christ. Jesus Christ told his disciples in verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. So Jesus Christ made himself available to the Father. Now, now it sounds like I'm talking about Jesus. Indeed I am, but it's about us. What Jesus is doing, he is using himself as the example to show us what it means to abide in him, just like he abides in the Father. So our abiding simply means that I've got to get rid of myself and let Jesus Christ be seen or magnified in my body. Now, the evidence of I am in the Father and the Father is in me was his perfect character. Now, the Apostle John says, says in this um, uh, vital union with Christ, Christ our God abides in the Christian. Now, now just take a look at these passages for a moment. Look at verse 10 of John chapter 14. He says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but, by the, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Then in John chapter 7 and verse 16, he says, so Jesus answered and said, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Then again in John chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has give of himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And he says, and I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Then in John chapter 14 and verse 24. John 14, 24, he says, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Now, Jesus not only, not only said what the Father told him to say, but everything he did was the Father's working in and through him. Look at verse 10. The Father abiding in me does his works. And then he says, the Father living in me is doing his work and the evidence is what you see. Now in John chapter 14 verse 20, 
Jesus took the idea of relationship one step further when he spoke of the Holy Spirit and the apostle he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you after a little while. The world will behold me no more, but you will behold me because I live. You shall live also. In that day you shall know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Verses 18 to 20. Now in the first epistle of John, the apostle says this vital union of remaining in Christ will make a difference in our behavior. I want us to get this. Christ abiding in us and us in him will make a difference in our behavior. Not just behavior, but also our attitude. So, when we display an ugly attitude, it is saying that Christ at this moment is not abiding in me. When I am unthankful, I'm saying that Christ is not abiding in me. Because when Christ abides in me, I am content and thankful. As a, the Apostle Paul would say, I've learned in all things how to be content. So John, the apostle says this, th this thing has, uh, makes a difference in our behavior. The one who says he abides or remains or resides in God on himself to walk just as Jesus walked. Now, that word meno indicates a close intimate and a permanent relationship between the Christian and his God. Now, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 6. Go to over to 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 6. Listen to what the Bible says. He that saith, he abides in him on himself also, so to walk even as he, Christ, walks. Now look at verse 24, that same chapter. Verse 24. It says, let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. What was from the beginning? Chapter 1 verse 1. Then look at verse 27. Verse 27 says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. But we're not through. Look at chapter 3 and verse 6. Of first John, first John three and verse six. Whosoever abideth in him <laughs> does not keep on committing sin. Not it doesn't say he does not sin. He said does not keep on committing sin. Whosoever sinneth or keeps on con um, committing sin had not seen him, neither know him. Keep those scriptures in mind. Furthermore, John chapter 14 verse 12. John 14 12. Truly, truly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also, or uh, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Now Jesus 
is not speaking of fantastic, spectacular miracles, but the preaching of the gospel. <laughs> Listen. The greater works is the taking of the good news of Jesus Christ and his saving work to the ends of the earth and seeing a great harvest of souls. The preaching on the day of Pentecost is an excellent example of these greater works. When we serve him according to his will, he will answer our prayers. We can see him do great and mighty things through us. I don't know if we actually see this. But Jesus is saying to you and to me that when we abide in him, we can do great and mighty works. And again, he is not talking about miracles because no one could do the miracles that he did. But guess what? Jesus preach the gospel in anticipation. We preach the gospel in fact. We see folks coming to Christ that Christ didn't see because he was still alive. He was not dead. You couldn't preach about Jesus and his crucifixion without him being dead and arose. Now we preach about Christ and his crucifixion. We can tell the world the experience of being in Christ and Christ being in me. It makes all the difference in the world. Listen, listen. Preaching the gospel is more than words. It is lifestyle. It is in conversation. It is how we appear. Yes, how we look, how we dress, how we talk, our attitudes, everything involved in preaching the gospel of Christ. Listen. It's like saying, you can't be hell at home, an angel on Sunday morning. That's hypocrisy. You got to be real 24 7. And Christ isn't asking us to be angels. He is asking us to be his followers. We're going to make mistakes, yes. But as soon as those mistakes uh, become evident, we are ready to say, I'm sorry, God. I apologize. I repent. That's why David is known of the, uh, of the man after God's own heart. Not because he didn't do anything wrong. But when he was shown he did something wrong, he was quick to repent. That is what we're talking about. Abiding in Christ and, and, and what we're looking at. Listen, listen. We are to ask what Jesus would ask the Father. We have the Holy Spirit abiding in us to guide us. Isn't that right? Acts 2 and verse 38. The limitations on the prayer promise is the intimate union and harmony with Christ that nothing will be asked out of accordance to his will. When we are in harmony, when we abide in Christ, we have some sense in us as to what is God's will other than as we read the word. And we know we're not going to ask for something that is against the will of God. Sometimes that's difficult, but sometimes we have to stay within the will of God. Let's see. The Apostle John says... That this vital union with Christ, Christ our God, abides in the believer. It is an intimate, personal relationship with him. For Jesus says he lives in us, John six fifty six. He says, he who eats my flesh. 
and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Is that what he said? Then John chapter 15 and verse 4, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless it abides in me. As I was studying this, I, I read something that was quite interesting. Why did Jesus choose the vine and the branches? It is suggested, of course, that when you walked near to some walls in Jerusalem, there were always vines going up the walls, up the mountainside. And he could draw attention to these vines and say, look, you see these vines? There's a root somewhere. There's a vine up there somewhere, but there are also branches. And those branches cannot exist without that vine. So they had an object lesson right before them. And you know what I'm talking about. Many of you plan stuff. And you know what the branches are. Cut those branches off and the branches will die. The vine won't necessarily, but the branches will. We are the branches. Cut us off or cut ourselves off. Remember, Christ did say that no one can take you out of my hands. But he didn't say one thing except me. See, I have that choice. I can remain with him or I can separate myself from him. It's my choice, but there are consequences to that choice. He's saying, remain united with me. Remain in an unbroken fellowship with me. Remain in vital union with me. I like that word vital because you can do nothing. You cannot be spiritually successful without Jesus. So this remaining in him is vital. So, remain is vital. Now, you think of this for a moment. The point Jesus is making is for the believer to maintain an unbroken fellowship with Christ. Stay focused. Stay rooted and grounded in him. Believe it or not, Everything that happens to us, good or bad, could serve as a reminder as to where we are in Christ. Everything bad that happens to us doesn't have to be bad for us. Remember what I said. Everything bad that happens to us doesn't have to be bad for us. Remember Romans 8, 28. God can make things good for us. I know that many of us, not all of us, have been in some very difficult situations. We came out, didn't we? How did that happen? By our own strength? By our own ability? Or because of the grace of God? Or as the songwriter says, we have learned to lean on Jesus. When you learn to lean on Jesus, it doesn't matter what struggles you're going through. Jesus is my leaning tower. Jesus is my fortress. Jesus is my rock in a weary land. I learned to stay in him. His presence alone makes all the difference in the world. Now, now, think again. The point that Jesus is making is for us to maintain that unbroken fellowship with him. Listen, we, 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 we have now made this spiritual 
residence in Christ. His abiding place is in Christ. The house has been cleansed by the blood of Christ. Nothing now stands between the believer and Christ. It is a holy fellowship. There is no better analogy than the vine and its branches. The believer draws his spiritual life and energy from the indwelling one. We abide in Christ and he in us. When we enter into that personal relationship by obeying the gospel of Christ. Listen, question. Have you appropriated him into your personal life? Just question. Are you continuing to persevere in his teachings? Listen. Are you obeying the commandments? Or his commandments, John chapter 15. Now we cannot produce spiritual fruit that will bring glory to God without a continual abiding in him. We cannot produce God's kind of fruit without the life of God within us. The remaining in him produces fruit again remember what Christ is saying abide in me why so that you will produce fruit and again we as we explained earlier what that fruit is there are two kinds of fruits here though they both one and that is number one character what Jesus does for us how our character change, how we now have integrity, how we don't have to lie and steal and cheat and all that kind of stuff because Jesus is in me and abide in him and he does not allow that kind of thing to flow from me because I am in him. But if we live without value, without a sense of value, if we live just to exist, we don't live. There is no real life without Jesus Christ. And the purpose of our remaining here is to produce spiritual fruit. And that spiritual fruit will bring glory to God. Uh, brothers, you can turn to me now. There are some abiding principles and practicing applications. When God invites us to come and join him in what he is doing, it is an invitation to an intimate personal relationship with him. Remember Matthew 11. Come on to me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Oh, Jesus Christ also said, I came not to call the righteous, so you don't need him no more, but sinners, to repentance, which of these two groups you belong to? One says, I don't need Jesus. The other is a constant reminder of my need for him. Listen, listen, listen. We are to him as the branch is to the vine. If we are to bear his kind of fruit, it must be in relationship to him. We can do nothing apart from drawing our strength from him. John 15 and verse 5. When we produce quality spiritual fruit, it depends entirely on the life of Christ being reproduced in me. 
You hear me? There are no shortcuts to fruit bearing. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. A passage that most of us are familiar with. The fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit, do you notice? It didn't say fruits. All these together, fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. What is he talking about when he said love? Listen to Paul. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, <laughs> I am become as a sounding brass, a tingling cymbal. cymbal. Without love, you sound like an old cowbell. <laughs> Everybody has motivation. What's yours? Everyone has motivation for what he or she does. What's yours? Think about it. Why do I do what I do? Why do I say what I say? And though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, he said, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers for a long, long time. Love is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. It seeketh not our own, is not easily provoked, and it thinks no evil. That's what Paul says about love. Remember, the fruit Jesus is expecting are deeds of love that demonstrate our relationship to God. I think you can find this again in Matthew 25. Now, Jesus does not expect words from us to earn God's favor, but evidences of life in the branches. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Not one, thunders the apostle Paul in Romans 8. Our abiding in Christ does not depend on us, but on making ourselves available to him. The issue in chapter 15 is on our relationship to God in bearing fruit. John is looking at the fact that we are now servants of God. We are now believers. We are now Christians. And what is expected of us is bearing fruit. If we are abiding in Christ, we will have a rich prayer life that supplies rich fellowship with him. How's yours? How is your prayer life? Sometimes uh, there are some things that I wonder about. Have it, has it ever happened to you that you're praying and you fall asleep? Yeah. Then you wake up later in the night and say, did I finish my prayer? Keep this in mind. I prefer die praying and fall asleep than not to pray at all. 
Because some of us can't keep our eyes open, especially if we're taking medication. But the point I'm making is, if you abide in Christ, you will have a rich prayer life. You will pray in the morning. You will pray at noontime. You will pray in the evening. Every time you eat, you will pray to God because you are so thankful. He woke me up this morning. And before you go to bed at night, you say, thank you for the day. And please, Lord, forgive me of any sin I have committed. You don't leave it up to chance and ask if. You just simply say you have. And ask God's forgiveness. And be sure that you don't go to bed with any resentment on your mind. Because that prayer isn't going anywhere. Isn't going anywhere. Listen, listen. So there has to be a rich prayer life. When we walk like Christ, we are always, we will always abide near Christ. The nearness of Christ always invites us to come and enter into that unbroken fellowship with him. That which makes a man holy is the perpetual abiding of the Holy Spirit in us. He doesn't come on Friday night and leave on Sunday night. Or he doesn't come when we go down to the church house. When you are baptized into Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, Acts 2 and verse 38. But he doesn't stay uninvited. He leads you to the word of God and you ought to read it. Each time you look at God's word or something happens to you, that spirit reminds you of what the word of God teaches. And if you have the right spirit, it will lead you to repentance. Listen. Listen. Help us, Lord, to draw closer to you every day we become like those with whom we associate <laughs> if we associate with folks who is governed and ruled by the spirit we'll be like them if we associate with folk that don't know God who curse and fuss and do all kind of stuff, we're going to become like them. Mm -hmm. He said, bad company, corrupt, good morals. We don't have to live like the world. We have been set apart for a holy purpose that is to serve Christ. So to abide in continual dependence upon Christ is to keep yourself in position of a childlike trust and dependence on him. Jesus said he could do nothing of his own. Therefore, we can do nothing of our own. Everything about abiding means we must remain united with him just as the Son remains united with the Father. You know what we have just done there? We have just finished the introduction to the sermon. So you got to come back next Sunday to hear the rest of the story. Come to Christ and abide in him. Christian brothers and sisters, we are faced with so many temptations. So many things happen around us. Wherever we are at work, even at home sometimes, there are so many distractions that we can't afford to give in. We got to say like Jesus sometimes, get thee behind me, Satan. Folks may not like that. <laughs> but if they are the devil's servants, you got to say, oh, I'm sorry. 
but I need some better company. You need to come to Christ this morning. Believing in him, repenting of your sins. Confessing his name before this crowd and be baptized to wash away your sins. Will you come to Christ this morning? As a Christian, you know your abiding has not been that good. It's time to make a change. It's time to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Will you come to him this morning as together we stand and sing? To save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood.